thank you so much to Sophie Roney, who's going to be our presenter. And um, I am grateful for the opportunity to introduce her. So Sophie is our the Research Parks recruiter in residence. So what that means is that she, um, as part of one of her many roles in life, um, she offers uh, services to our companies to help them um, in their with their recruitment strategies, as well as to help them find the talent that they need, um, optimize job descriptions. On the other hand, uh, since um, March, we've also been, she's also been doing some more direct work with some of our the job seekers in our community and uh, making sure uh, we have a wonderful, talented community that uh, has a lot of skills and trying to match skills with employers. So um, Sophie has a background in recruitment. She um, has worked for several local tech companies before she went on her own to be a recruitment consultant. Uh, and she is a native of our community. And we're really lucky to have somebody of her acumen and creativity and skill set to be part of our community here in the research park and broadly within Champaign-Urbana. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Sophie. Thanks so much for being with us today. As Laura said, I'm Sophie. I'm a recruiter and also a native of the Champaign-Urbana area. I wear a few different hats along with being the recruiter in residence for Research Park and um, providing presentations like this in order to go over a specific way to increase your ability to be recruited. So um, without further ado, let's get going. So this presentation is about optimizing your LinkedIn presence. So why use LinkedIn? Like any social network, LinkedIn is only as valuable as its number of users. LinkedIn has an incredible amount of users. So 690 million was the latest stat, which is global. And that's a crazy amount of overall users really for any social media, especially a professional one. And the great thing about LinkedIn is that many recruiters are there. It's actually for recruiters intentionally. And with the recruiters that are present on LinkedIn, 94% of them actually use it in order to find people to hire. And the other great aspect is that 40% of its users actually check in daily. So it's a very active place, a very active social media. It's shareable, of course. There's thousands of professional groups. It's a great place to do research, look for jobs, as well as get updated company information and news. And then you'll see to the right, you can have a virtual business card. So if you don't have that downloaded on your phone yet, feel free to do that. It's a great way to share your information as you run into people. So LinkedIn has a ton of different functionalities. You can use it for business development, for generating leads, for marketing your business, finding talent, posting jobs. Today, we're just focusing on when you're looking to find a job and promote yourself. That is what this presentation is for. All of those other categories are a completely different presentation. So how is LinkedIn different from your resume? Your LinkedIn, the key difference is that it quickly makes you findable, which is what is really important for a job seeker is to be findable. Now, when you are creating your LinkedIn, it needs to be consistent with your resume. It needs to have the same dates, titles, and education. However, it can be more informal and have more personality than you would with a specific resume. And having a LinkedIn helps you potentially speed up the recruitment process as if the right person comes across and finds your LinkedIn, you're able to skip parts of the recruitment process potentially by getting your information, your career history in the hands of the right people. And recruiters will frequently, I myself do this, look at a private resume I've received and cross-reference it with a LinkedIn just as a check to make sure that truthfulness and honesty is there and see if there's any discrepancies. So a lot of people ask if you should post your 
PDF of your resume on your LinkedIn? And the short answer here is no. It's just too risky. So a lot of people will do it in lieu of actually just post or actually just completing their profile. And once you get going, it really doesn't take that long. It might seem daunting at first, but do not just post a PDF in, um, in replacement of actually just filling out your resume. It's a pretty big privacy concern. So oftentimes your LinkedIn has very specific dates on it in terms of when you were in school, where you went to school, and LinkedIn does too. But combined with potentially your address and your phone number, it's a little bit too much information to put out there uh, for anyone to be able to look at, distribute without your knowledge. And it may decrease the option that a recruiter would just message you or a hiring manager message you and ask you for a copy of your resume that you would then have the ability to tailor to that specific industry or job where if you have your profile actually on your LinkedIn, that person might not contact you. They may simply just ask your, or look at your, the PDF of your resume and assume that you're not a good fit for the role. So the short answer to here is no, it's always just a better idea to make your LinkedIn profile as compelling as possible. So there's two basic versions of LinkedIn we're looking at today in terms of being a career searcher or being a job seeker. So most people here probably have the basic or free version of LinkedIn, which is completely fine. Uh, the key upgrade that you may be looking into as an active job seeker would be the premium career, which is then $30 a month. The main difference that you'll get in between the two a free version or a paid version is your ability to one search and then two actually be able to message people on LinkedIn that you are not connected with. You can message anybody that you are connected with. Now, my recommendation here is to use the basic version as long as possible. And then when you are ready to start a very active career search, or a new job search, upgrade for a month, contact everybody, do all the searches that you need to, and then go back to basic once you've completed the research and the contacts that you look to make. And for your awareness and in-mail is basically a LinkedIn credit system for you to be able to contact anybody on LinkedIn without being connected to them. It's a large reason why recruiters pay for LinkedIn products which leads to how does LinkedIn make money? So believe it or not, 65% of LinkedIn's revenue actually comes from recruiters from me. So I actually pay for a buffed up version of LinkedIn, which means that LinkedIn is made for people like me, not necessarily for the people using the free product. The people using the free product or even the $30 version are the product. So, the core users are recruiters. They are the ones paying all of LinkedIn's bills. And the goal is to help recruiters find you, to find your contact information, your skill set, your work history, and your ability to be contacted or your attention. So LinkedIn's whole goal is to cater to recruiters to help them find the information that they need. So given this, that, that LinkedIn is basically for people searching, recruiters, hiring managers, companies, and other professionals, how can you structure your profile so that you make yourself findable in the way that the core users, recruiters, using the platform are using it? What does that even look like? So we'll get into that um, as we discuss how to go about creating or, or revamping your profile. Uh, here's a pause. Um, any specific questions that, that I can answer so far? It looks like Lori Patterson just asked a question. She wants to know when recruiters ask to connect with you, should you accept? I think so. And we'll get into that because 
if you are using the free or the premium version, your capabilities on LinkedIn are limited by your number of connections. So your search capabilities and your messaging capabilities are limited by your number of connections. And um, typically recruiters, the worst that they'll do is message you. So there's not a really high risk of connecting with a recruiter. The one thing that they might be doing is connecting with you in order to get access to your contacts. So that would be the only um, intention that might be less than obvious that a, that a recruiter would be connecting you for. Good question. Okay, so <sighs> recruiters are uh, detectives. Sophie, uh, along those lines, uh, yeah. uh, focus is on recruiters using LinkedIn, but it's also used in sales a lot. So those of us yeah. who do development. And I have this question sometimes too of, do I want to accept people that are competitors of ours, like other university people in similar roles, because they're mining your network. So right. I don't know, you kind of think about who's, who's helpful to have in your network and who is uh, sort of predatory on your contacts. Yeah, so that's a good point. So there's definitely the point of view where somebody is befriending you or contacting you on LinkedIn, connecting with you in order to get access to your network. However, if they pay for LinkedIn, so for example, I pay for the recruiter version of LinkedIn, it's more expensive, but there's nobody that I cannot see because I pay for that. So if that person is willing to pay for it, they can get access to really anybody anyways, but it's definitely useful to know who certain people are connected with. So if you decide not to be connected with someone, go for it. But it's um, hopefully it's usually not too uh, negative of an intent. Recruiters and those alike, business development, this falls into that category as well, um, can definitely be creepy on LinkedIn and other social media platforms in general. So this is a really interesting, this is LinkedIn with a Chrome extension laid on top. So this just gives you an idea of how much people can see about you. So if you use the same photo for various different social media platforms, the same email, the same phone number, those are all cross-referenced in a simple, in a simple Google Chrome extension. So the one to the left, is Intello, the one to the right is a newer recruiting software that basically combines every single place that you are online. So your Google account, your Facebook, your Instagram, your Goodreads, your Amazon wish list, your Twitter account, your Pinterest. And so anything that is not professional content, you need to make sure is extremely private and anything that you wouldn't want someone to see that's searching you on LinkedIn because you can you can basically see anything that is not set to private on these various different sites and there's a lot of companies that make a lot of money off of combining all of your information into one place to make it easy for people to research you. So from these two screenshots, I hope you see how easy it is for people to really dig about in, into you very quickly. Uh, and it might not seem fair, but it's also just the reality of the situation in this technological age that um, that many companies make money off of selling selling your information. So if you're on these social media accounts, great, keep them extremely private. If you're keeping them, make sure that you wouldn't be embarrassed if somebody um, from the professional world were to were to stumble upon it. Okay, so how recruiters search. So this is a screenshot, and I'll actually open mine in a moment. This is a screenshot of what it looks like on the other end. So I can search by your title, your location, your skills, and I'll dig into how skills are different from keywords. Your year of graduation, your name, your network relationships, and that's where that other question comes into play of who should I actually allow in my network your seniority, which is based off of the title that you have linked in to your profile. And then I can even look if you're recently joined to LinkedIn, maybe I want to find new people to the platform that haven't really been contacted yet. 
if you have some type of diversity status. So this one is military veterans. And then I can also see if you are in, if we are in the same groups. I can look at specific groups, but I can see if we have any groups actually in common. And then of course your companies that you've been a part of. This is slightly more advanced. So if you dig a little, even a little bit deeper, I can see if somebody has recently updated their profile. So you can look into recruiting activity and that will tell me, even if your LinkedIn is set to private where your status updates or your profile updates are not broadcasted to the general LinkedIn community, a recruiter can search that you might be looking for a job if you've recently updated your LinkedIn profile. Another interesting thing here is that I can look and see if a, where it says ATS under applicants, I can see if, if I'm a corporate recruiter at a company, I will link my applicant tracking system to my LinkedIn account. And therefore I can see if the person that I'm looking at or if anybody on LinkedIn is actually already in my company's database. And therefore I know that there's, that they've already been contacted or I know that this person has already expressed interest in my company and therefore it might be more efficient for me to actually contact them. Okay, so now I'll do a brief demo in order to show you what it actually looks like on my end doing a quick search. Okay, so let's say I'm looking for a graphic designer. I'll go to graphic designer and then I have the option of where I look. So I'll say I'm looking in Champaign. Even if you look here, you'll see I have a few different options for Champaign. I can look in Champaign County, Champaign, Illinois itself, or the specific area. You want to note that because you have the same option on your end in the profile creation part where you can pick if you choose the area, your just your zip code, or if you choose a, to be a part of a county. I'm going to skip adding the skills for now, but then I would add a skill. So now already LinkedIn tells me that I have the option of seeing 353 candidates, and then I can go through and change things. So, and we'll just do a simple version of this so that you get the feel for it and so a few other things make sense down the line. So now I can look for skills. Skills in LinkedIn are only things that you have told LinkedIn when creating your profile. These are the five skills that I have. They are not keywords. A keyword is anything that is populated on your profile. So that's any word in your experience, in your education, in your about me section that you have put on your profile. So a skill is different than a keyword, very, very different. So if I'm looking for somebody that specifically has Adobe experience, I would put that in and that means that that person has self-identified as having Adobe experience. So this is how you should think about it when you're building the skills section is if I'm looking for a specific job and I know that these are the skills on the job, put those as the skills, if they're honest, on your, in your skill section as well. You have the option to add, of course, these other different variables when searching for people. And I'll get into the details, but I think it's helpful to see what this looks like. And then you're able to you're able to look at all of these different candidates and, and set up different, different lists and then contact people. So that's how it looks when a recruiter or somebody else or someone in business development is searching for you or is searching for something specific. So that's a brief introduction into how recruiters search and therefore you can reverse engineer how you want to be found on LinkedIn. So if you only ask yourself three questions then when you're creating your profile, those questions should be, what do you want a, a visitor to learn when they are visiting your profile? So what type of professional are you? What do you have to offer a given company? What actions would you like them to take? Do you want them to go to your website? Do you want them to connect? Do you want them to contact you via email? Do you want them to buy your book? Um, check out a video, a presentation be your next client, 
be your next employer? And um, in terms of what information do you want them to know about you? What keywords, and we'll dig into keywords, will help them find you? And a great example of Shan Champagne Native is Brandon Doman here. So I've asked him if I can share his profile in this presentation. And when you go to Brandon's profile, there is no question about what he is doing and what he likes he would like you to do as soon as you come across his LinkedIn page. Okay, so keywords. The name of the game here is synonyms. So if I'm going to look for a business analyst, I'm not just looking, I'm not just typing in business analyst or as I just demoed, graphic designer. I'm typing in every single synonym that I can think of or job title that would also mean that I'm looking, that has the same skill set or is the same type of employee as a business analyst. So these are real searches that recruiters use and an idea of how you would then construct your LinkedIn and what titles you want, want to think about and keywords when populating your own, your own profile. So that's an example of a title. Another example is say I'm looking, I need a signal that somebody is a high achiever in their given industry or field. I might look for somebody that's won a coding contest or a challenge. And so these are all the keywords that I would type in to understand, to only give me people that have won coding challenges. You can do the same thing and People do do the same thing for looking for diversity signals, that you have some type of an honor, publications, articles, and patents. So when you're populating your resume and your LinkedIn profile, you need to think about those different synonyms that other people may use to search that mean the same thing so that you'll come up in as many searches as possible. So your profile makes you findable. That's the key with LinkedIn. You're on there to be found and to network. In order to determine what keywords you populate your profile with, an easy direct way to do that is to look if you're targeting a certain job type, download five of those job descriptions, copy and paste them, put them into Wordle, then Wordle will give you, these are the top 10 to 20 words used in this combined text. Then you know these are the keywords that these types of employers are looking for. And then you add those into your profile. So they should be honest, they should be true, of course, um, but at least you know the vocabulary that those employers are using to talk about finding you so make yourself findable and those are and every recruiter will also cross-reference the job description that they are recruiting for so it's a good way to just make sure that there is a good match now again we all know that you likely wrote unless you hire your personal assistant you wrote your LinkedIn profile so there's no need to put it in uh, third person and add your personality to it and the last part of this is for marketing. You have the option super easily in three minutes to customize your LinkedIn URL to make it very shareable and um, and it's called a vanity URL. So that's definitely a first customization to take if you have not already done so and the recommendation is just first name last name. Other primary customizations. So title is best or for title, standardization is best. So don't use, don't use unique or fancy titles. You want just true and standard industry titles. So if you're a software engineer, don't use Code Wrangler. If you're a UX designer, don't say designer extraordinaire. You just want to use the titles that someone will actually think about when looking for that specific title. Um, so your headline should just be quick overview of your top assets, what you specifically offer your current employer or your future employer, your photo. So having a photo makes you already 
according to this, 36 times more appealing just having a photo and then a professional headshot increases or multiplies that as well. So you can dig into this link here about what makes a photo good or bad or, or what that photo may say about you. So section by section here. The about in the summary part of your LinkedIn is likely the hardest thing to come up with. And um, it's, it's already really tricky. Uh, there's no master recipe, but again, you get to add your personality. It still needs to be concise. Most people don't spend that amount of time looking at your LinkedIn, even if you're one of the top search results. So it still needs to be readable in a minute or so. Um, and if you are a, if you are a secret job seeker, this is a great place to add your email and say, I'm always interested in networking. Feel free to contact me at my personal email here. It allows other LinkedIn members to contact you that might not have an elevated subscription. Make sure that it's still professional and um, you don't want buzzwords. So buzzwords are jargon, industry, um, non-specific words. Keywords are concise wordings that specifically relate to actionable parts of your job. And you always want to highlight achievements, awards, and accolades, and um, actual things that you have done versus more generic aspects of your background. A story is always compelling. And then I encourage you to click on this link as well on the bottom bullet point, and you'll see what LinkedIn themselves said were some of the top 10 profiles on LinkedIn. And always add your, if you have work examples, it is a great way to show whoever is looking at your LinkedIn that you can execute. You don't just talk about executing. So on the experience section, LinkedIn has made a great new feature in the past two years or so where you can very clearly visualize your promotion pattern. And that's a lot what hiring managers and other people are looking for when looking to hire somebody is do they have a pattern of progression? Do they have a pattern of achievement? So if you've been at the same company, but you've gotten three different roles, you should definitely know how you have grown within that company. And it only takes a few minutes to add something like that. Um, if you have a employment gap, it's really important to attempt to put some type of an explanation. You can always consult with a lawyer of how to actually describe that gap. But if you leave it out, it leaves incredible room just for skepticism and people will come up with their own imagination of why you had a certain amount of unfilled time, unemployment time, or just unspoken for time. And, um, and then be as specific and quantifiable as possible. With education, one of the things you can do is if you're concerned about age bias in any way on the young side or on the elder side is to take away dates from your university experience or from your education. And then this way, someone can't assume how old you are based off of when you graduated your bachelor's or your master's. And then um, attach, of course, any, any certain honorable achievements that you made at, um, within your education. Always put in, if you are involved outside of, outside of work or education in the community, Put that on your LinkedIn as it makes you more human, and that's what it's for. It makes you more relatable and more of a whole person other than this person that goes to work. Skills and endorsements. So as I mentioned earlier, your skills are something that you essentially more hard code into your profile. So if a recruiter is searching for skills, it's saying, I'm looking for somebody that has hard coded into their profile. Yes, I confirm I have these three skills, which again is different than a keyword. So you can use up to 50. And it's also important to think about this when you think of synonyms. So if you're in project management, what are the other ways to say project management that someone might search for? And then if you 
are, are, if you are going for that title, what are then the technologies within that and what are their synonyms and picking the ones that best describe your skill set. For endorsements, I think this is the, the worst part <laughs> about LinkedIn. Um, they just have very, very low credibility. If any of you have spent time on LinkedIn, you know that it's incredibly easy to endorse somebody and you may have been endorsed by people that you don't even know. And so everyone has typically had those experiences and therefore endorsements, unless they're within the 50s or 100 marks, they don't mean a, a heck of a lot in terms of actually substantiating your skill set. It will aid in your recruiter search. So if you are really aiming to increase your ranking in Python or a certain skill set in Scrum, then, um, then you could ask people that actually know you um, or that you've worked with to endorse you on them. So as a part of networking, we'll dig into recommendations. So this was also brought up before, your connections do matter in terms of if you're using the basic version of LinkedIn, your ability to search and message. So your search is very limited. It's limited by your first and second degree connections. So if you want to increase your ability to search, you should increase your connections. Now, um, connections also equal phone and email if the person has said so on their privacy settings. So if you are connected to someone, you can typically get their email address and then have another way to connect with them if you wanted to send them an email outside of LinkedIn. And I won't read this verbatim, but you should always add a quick note. It's, uh, it's just lazy to connect with somebody and not say why or, um, and, and then it takes out any room for, for skepticism on that side too. So recommendations. It's, um, it's relatively easy to ask for a recommendation, but you should definitely take time when, when doing so. So recommendations are important because it's someone that's essentially left a, a professional review for you. It's like a Yelp review. They're trying to make a purchasing decision, someone who's visiting your profile and so, or a hiring decision. And so they want to know that other people have had a positive experience working with you. So they're a great, they're a great addition to your LinkedIn. That's a quick photo of how you actually go to somebody's profile to ask for a recommendation. Um, but a few tips here is, don't ask for a bunch at once because you can see the months or the days even that they all come in. And so you want them to be spread apart. Um, some recruiters care, some don't. And um, really pay attention to who you're asking for a recommendation or, or who's on your profiles. That's, that's an extension really of, of you. And, um, and you want that to be someone that also matches your, your profession or professional values. So when asking for a recommendation, there's a right way to do it. Um, the top is not. <laughs> so if someone's going to take the time to write you a recommendation, then you can take the time to ask them thoughtfully for one. So this is a, this is a, this is not true about me, but it's my name. Um, but this is a, just an example of how you could ask for a recommendation. You, if you have one on your profile, you want it to be thoughtful and therefore take the 10, 15 minutes to, um, to graciously ask for someone to write your uh, recommendation and, and if it makes sense for you to write one back. So groups. Uh, there's a ton that you can join on LinkedIn. The more specific and the more niche uh, the better. As you saw, I can search for groups that people are in and, um, and I can search for people that have common groups with me. I can also go there to message people. You can increase your messaging capability by joining groups. So that's one of the great parts. You don't have to be connected to, with someone to message them if you're part of the same group. And, uh, and they often have uh, jobs specific to that group, which is a way to search for jobs more, um, more stealthily. 
you can join groups in almost any category. Alumni groups are just fantastic in order to gain more connections with people of uh, common backgrounds. And then uh, just one do not do, don't, don't join political groups, don't join um, anything that might be puzzling to somebody that maybe that doesn't know you that very well. You want to keep those groups um, definitely professional. And when you are contacting somebody from a group, again, be thoughtful about uh, how you contact, how you contact people. Okay, so actually moving on to, you found a job and you want to get hired. How do you use LinkedIn now? So you know that your profile is ranked when somebody searches for you. You need to make sure that your profile is as complete as possible with those various different keywords. More complete profiles turn up at the beginning of search results. Um, less complete are near the middle or the end. Standardizing your job titles, your top skills, and, um, and then this is a note, if you have a unique job title for some reason, that's just how your company is, but you want it to match your resume, you can put in the about me section my title is unique to X company. However, in our industry, it can be best compared to um, customer success manager or something like that. So that even if it's a unique, strange title, but you want it to be consistent with your resume and look honest to your boss and your colleagues, you can add a copy up there. So stealth mode job seeking turn on all of your privacy settings. So hopefully if you do one thing after this, you go into your privacy settings on LinkedIn and you change it. Um, anytime you update your LinkedIn, that sends a activity feed by default to everyone that you're connected with. So if you're going in and you're changing a bunch of things about your LinkedIn, turn off your activity feed. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not a signal to recruiters. So recruiters will still get signaled that you updated your profile, but all of your connections will not. Um, do not show that you're open to work if you are stealthily seeking a job because um, it's really not foolproof. So you don't know who really has a recruiter account. LinkedIn claims that people from your organization won't be able to see it, but that's just not, um, I don't think that it's trustworthy enough to risk it. And especially if you're in a smaller community, it, I, would not, I would not turn it on. And then uh, if you're creating a new profile in order to look for a job, just make sure you say good things about your current employer. So make it helpful for their marketing. Again, you can add your email address um, and you can send private messages and always reiterate that to anybody that you're speaking with that your job search is confidential and just remind them about that. And then you can download a one great way to do a quick research is you actually own all of your LinkedIn connections. So you can download all of your LinkedIn connections into a Excel sheet and you can go through all of your connections, first, last name, title, email. So you can get a quick up-to-date view of where everybody is and then decide who you might want to contact or reach out to um, for help with your job search. And that's in the appendix of how to do that. So you found the job. It might be obvious that you should apply, but not everybody actually applies. A lot of people will contact somebody on LinkedIn before applying. It's a little annoying because you want to have all of your information prepared and show that you did your due diligence prior to applying for a job. So, or prior to contacting someone on LinkedIn about a job. So make sure that you follow their asked for process and then contact the person on LinkedIn about the job. Let them know you applied, why you're a fit, another copy of your resume, handy, and um, something that you might have in common or, or, or a note. Um, if you want to email the person, it's likely that their email is already on their LinkedIn. Okay, so this is a champagne company. We'll do a quick example of how to find somebody at a company that you might be looking for on uh, on LinkedIn basic. So I'll switch my screen once more. 
Okay, so this is LinkedIn Basic, as you can see here. Oop, let's go back. This is LinkedIn Basic. And so this is just what, this is my profile. This, um, this is what is free that everybody should have access to. So if I want to search for a job at Riverbed, I click on Riverbed, but this is a national company. I know that they have a Champagne branch. I go over to see all of their employees on LinkedIn. Now I can see everybody that identifies as working at Riverbed. Filter by location. I only want to see the people that work in Champaign, apply, and now I can see the 11 people that, um, that work for Riverbed. That's relatively simple. Of course, you can see more if you have an elevated version of, uh, of LinkedIn, but then you can go through and see who is a manager, who might I be able to contact about, uh, about this specific job that I'm interested in in at that company and maybe ask them out for coffee or for a, a quick zoom date or a phone call to uh, ask about tips about applying to or being recommended for that position when searching a company look for employees with common themes that you may share it's a great way to figure out the values and the formality of the company do does everybody have outdoor photos on their linkedin um, are, are they all with their dogs are they a little bit more buttoned up in terms of um, the types of things or the humor on their resume or on their LinkedIn and, or do they all have suits in their, in their profile? I'll give you an example of uh, how formal the company is. And just like when somebody is searching for you on LinkedIn, you have to think that way when searching for other people. So a hiring manager can also be described as a lead, a head of, a manager. Recruiters are also known as talent acquisition managers, a technical recruiter, um, head of talent. Uh, human resources is now known as people operations in many industries. Engineering manager can be a principal engineer, a staff engineer, a technical lead. Every company has their own hierarchies, so remember to think that way in the reverse as well. Many hiring managers actually put on their LinkedIn, I'm hiring, and so, or I'm hiring for, my team is hiring, they want a referral bonus, and so you can also search for that as well in terms of keywords. This is an example of some fantastic profiles. Again, Brandon, thank you for letting me use yours in this, and um, some of these are from LinkedIn itself, and you can click through and see how these different people from different industries and job descriptions and seniority levels are um, making themselves stand out on LinkedIn and, and describing themselves and telling their story in a professional manner. Now, if you only do two things, definitely fill out your complete education, your work experience, and add your email. Make sure that email actually goes to an email that you check. Hopefully a personal email or a work email if you use LinkedIn a lot for work. And then please change your privacy settings so that you know how people are viewing you, you know what people can see, and um, the best version of you on the internet is shown to somebody that's searching for you so that you can um, give yourself the best advantage when, when job seeking. All right, that's the end of the presentation. Please note that there are some upcoming events that relate to this presentation. So the Catalyze resume and LinkedIn profile reviews are something that you can take advantage of. And uh, I believe the links are all on Research Park, of course. And thank you. This is my LinkedIn, please, uh, please connect with me. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, uh, Sophie, this is Dan McHugh. Uh, Duwani also asked this question earlier about, in the chat, about the dates. Um, I've had recruiters tell me, take all my dates off of LinkedIn. I've had recruiters tell me, if there's no dates on LinkedIn, I won't look at your profile. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm curious as to what you think about dates, specifically as it refers to the graduation dates and, or at, for your time at university, and also the dates that are related to a job. For your experience, I would always put dates in there. 
Um, I think that leaves more room for skepticism if your dates are not in your experience. The only place I would recommend leaving out dates, and it's only if you feel like um, ageism bias might be a thing, is just with your graduation date. Um, every recruiter is just going to be different and we're all going to have different opinions. And so it's trial and error at some point, everyone has just a different philosophy there. But um, my rule of thumb is I would just, I would not do it with experience at all. Uh, it, that looks a little bit, I think more dishonest, even if that's not the intention. And then with education, that's the only place that I would leave it out. Um, and specifically with a bachelor's degree, as if that was just, um, quite quite long ago in your past. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Are there any other questions? Hey, Sophie, I, I have a sort of maybe a different question. If, if um, So jobs that come by uh, recruiting companies, are, there, are they always for small companies or can big companies also hire like recruiting companies for them? Thank you. Yeah, it's all across the board in terms of t size of companies that use recruiters. Um, it, small companies will use recruiters, large companies will use recruiters. It's, there's, there's not a ton of rhyme and reason. Typically smaller companies will use them less just because they can be really expensive. And so larger companies are known to use recruiters probably a little bit more just because they have the financial capacity to do so. And they might be the velocity or quantity might be higher. Um, however, all, all types of companies size wise will use recruiters. And especially if it's a very niche role, um, niche role and or, uh, Niche. So here's an example. Most companies will not use a recruiter for something more of a common role. A common role would be a office manager position um, there because the supply would likely be larger than the demand. On the other end, if there somebody's looking for a senior biomedical scientist, they're likely to use a, more likely to use a recruiter as that's a very specific search. They might need the person to relocate and they're looking within a certain um, salary range. So it depends. I would say it more depends on the role that's being recruited for than the actual size of the company. Thank you. I've worked for all sizes of companies, so. Hey, Sophie, we had a question earlier that if you're contacted by a recruiting company, does this directly mean that the hiring company is a small company? No. Mm -mm. It, it might, yeah, it could mean that it, they don't have their own recruiting team, they don't have their own recruiter, but it could also mean that it's, it's a niche role. Um, yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a large or small company. There's no, you can, you can ask, you can just respond and say, I'm only, I'm interested in the size of company. What, what size is the company that you're referring to? Typical, sometimes recruiters are pretty hush hush about the company that they're recruiting for because they don't want you to just go apply on that company's website because then they lose you as a, they lose you as a candidate, as somebody that they could make commission off of. Yeah, this is right. something that I, so I troll LinkedIn a lot for the job postings in Champaign-Urbana, um, mainly because of issues like this. So I've seen a lot of trends. One of the trends is what you just described, Sophie, is that I see a recruitment company post a job and I know exactly who that job has been posted for, yeah. but Again, it's often a very niche job and that recruiter has been, you know, basically hired as a headhunter. Yeah. Another thing, though, that I would say that I see is that there are companies that are posting jobs that look like they are in Champaign-Urbana that are not. So just mm -hmm. um, an FYI, a heads up for those of you who are who are um, 
are interested in place issues. And so there are some of that that goes on. Supposedly that's illegal on LinkedIn, but um, I have flagged it plenty of times. Um, so anyway, just an FYI, but also there are sometimes companies that will hire. Um, so like a large company in the research park that, uh, that may hire contractors through another company, which is actually a very large company, but in essence, the work is being done for um, that company in the research park, but, but they're being hired by a third party employer. So that happens too. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Or companies that know that Champaign-Urbana has a high supply of a certain type of this talent. Um, that makes sense why they would act like they're posting in that area. Are there any other questions? Um, you know, when you mentioned that you could download connections, is that available to everyone, even if you're just a free LinkedIn user? Yep. Yep. You can, you can just Google it, how to download my connections and then you you will literally it takes them probably a few hours to actually send you an email but then they send you an email with just literally excel sheet of all of your connections and that's by far the easiest way to try to think about who you should reach out to at the beginning of your job search and get like an update on past colleagues and such where they're at now what titles they have um really easy great awesome and I think one last question, which you may have answered, um, is there value in adding your university courses along with descriptions? It doesn't hurt. It definitely doesn't hurt, especially if you've taken specific, very specific courses. Um, if you're a user experience designer and you just took the psychology of uh, the Apple interface or something like that, that's very specific, but uh, but if you're going for something specific and you've taken the coursework because you because you're target you've been targeting that job, absolutely, I would add that. And um, off the top of my head, I can't think of any reason why you shouldn't add it besides it's starting to look clutter. It, so I wouldn't add very generic courses. I wouldn't add that you took Psychology 101. Um, but if it's specific and relates to the job that you're targeting then yeah all right and i think i had missed one when you work for two different companies at the same time but part-time should you should you mention both yeah yeah i would mention that you can you can put that you should be able to add that in terms of dates in a in a parallel fashion and you can write in the experience section or the blurb that this was a part-time job I did in conjunction with the job below at company Y. Uh, I think that's important because when you talk to somebody and they real and they think that that, Oh, well you were, this was only a part-time job. What else were you doing? I think it's impressive or it shows a, a certain level of worth at work ethic when you were doing them simultaneously. And that's clear. Great. Thank you very much. I think those were all the questions we had. Nice, on time. <laughs> okay, well, thank you then.